This is our last session for today. After this time, we'll have some questions and then we'll have lunch. And then we're gonna let Ian rest. And we can, you can write down your questions and, uh, and then if you'd like, we can bring them up on Sunday evening. But we're gonna let him rest after that, okay? So um, let's get our time together started. Thank you. <clears throat> We've seen in John Owen's understanding of communion with God that believers have communion with the Father in love, supremely but not exclusively. We have communion with the Son in grace, not exclusively but by way of eminency. And we have communion with the Spirit in comfort again not exclusively but by way of eminency and so in this address we're going to be thinking about communion with the son of god in grace and owen begins his exposition like this we have communion with christ as mediator there is only one mediator between god and man the man christ jesus we have communion with god in union with Christ the mediator and as mediator says Owen he meets us in grace and as I said earlier two-thirds of Owen's treatise on communion with God is taken up with the topic of the communion we have with the Son in grace and as I said that is because Owen is concerned that we rightly understand that we meet with God in the person of the mediator and because Christ is the the focus the focal point the entry point into communion with God he is the entry point as mediator and as mediator he meets us in grace and Owen highlights a number of biblical texts to make his point he highlights for example John 1 uh, 14 uh, and 16 the word became flesh and dwelt among us we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth and he highlights a number of other texts that make the same point the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And so Owen writes, this then is that which we are peculiarly to eye in the Lord Jesus and to receive from him even grace, gospel grace. So we are to eye the Father supremely as love, not as a disapproving Father, but as a gracious, loving Father, we are to eye the Father as love, but we are peculiarly, particularly to eye in the Lord Jesus grace, even gospel grace. As I mentioned last evening, um, Owen understands Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, not as an evangelistic text, which of course it isn't as such, though it could be used as such, I suppose, but it is addressed to the church and to a church that had become lukewarm you'll remember so lukewarm that Christ said I would rather just spit you out of my mouth and Jesus comes to that church behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hears my voice and open the door I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me and so to sit at table with Christ in Owen's understanding is to have Christ enjoying his graces in the saints and the saints conversely feasting on Christ and his glory. When we talk about communion with God, the Father in love, the Son in grace, and the Spirit in comfort, we must always seek to remember that the significant thing is not what we are getting out of it, but what God is getting out of it. 
It's an amazing thing that we, by God's grace, can bring pleasure to God. That we can give him delight. Christ delights, says Owen, to see his one, his blood one, graces in his saints. And this for Owen was the height of spiritual delight and worthy of the most sensual poetic expressions in the Song of Songs. In the midst of his exposition on communion with the Son in grace, Owen spends about 80 to 90 pages on expounding the Song of Songs. And he expounds it absolutely Christocentrically and Christologically. Now that's not very popular uh, in today's modern um, exegetical world, even in reform circles. But I think Owen is far more right than the moderns. Most modern commentaries that I've looked at on the Song of Songs, I heartily dislike for any number of reasons, but two in particular. One is the modern commentaries don't take seriously the emphasis and the echoes in the New Testament that point you back to the Song of Songs. Not least Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, that's just Song of Songs chapter 5. Joan and I were finishing reading the song this morning, and the song finishes with the bride saying, Come quickly, my beloved. And you cannot but think of the end of Revelation 22, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. The church is the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, other places. And so the New Testament, in a very sotto voce way, in a, in, in, in a very um, unemphatic way, highlights and nuances echoes from the Song of Songs. Another thing I just heartily dislike about probably most modern commentaries on the songs, even in the Reformed tradition, is that they seem to view the song purely horizontally. Now, there's a horizontal truth about the song. It's celebrating um, a godly, righteous um, relationship between a man and a woman. And that needs to be emphasized today, doesn't it? But the horizontal is only given significance by the vertical. And that's why Ephesians 5, Paul will say to husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so for Owen, as he reads the Song of Songs, he sees this richly sensual poetic imagery and it speaks so powerfully to him of the communion that the bride has with her beloved, with the church has with Jesus Christ. So fellowship with Christ feeds the soul with sweetness, delight, safety, and comfort. And Owen analyzes the grace of Christ in two ways. There is first his personal grace, and secondly, his purchase grace, focusing on the work of Christ, his personal grace and his purchase grace. And we'll look at those two. We have communion with Christ in his personal grace. And as I said, for Owen, Christ's personal grace, the grace that attaches to and inheres in his very person as the God-man, the theanthropic one, John Ono actually says, the glory of the Christian church is, I wonder how you'd complete the sentence. I'm sure it can be completed in any number of ways. The glory of the Christian church is the hypostatic union. The union in Jesus Christ of two natures, the divine and the human. And for Owen, the person of Christ is replete with grace. Christ is the believer's husband. And so responding to his personal grace, the grace of his person as the God-man, involves, says Owen, this is a great statement, 
involves the liking of Christ for his excellency, grace, and suitableness. Far above all other beloveds whatever, preferring him in the judgment and mind above them all, and accepting Christ by the will as its only husband, Lord, and Savior. This is called, says Owen, receiving Christ. Communion with Christ in his personal grace involves liking Jesus for who he is. You see, liking, that's it's not a very elevating word. Well, actually, it is. Liking him for his excellency, his suitableness. He is just exactly the beloved that I need. Preferring him in the judgment and mind above all other beloveds. And so Owen characteristically continues in this vein. He says, let believers exercise their hearts abundantly unto this thing. This is choice communion with the Son, Jesus Christ. Let us receive him in all his excellencies. Be frequent in thoughts of faith, comparing him with other beloveds. Other beloveds? Well, says Owen, there are other beloveds. There's sin and the world and legal righteousness. But we are to prefer Christ above all these other potential beloveds, preferring him before them all, counting them all loss and dung in comparison to him. And then notice these words. These have always spoken deeply to me. Tell him that you will be for him and not for another. Let him know it from you. He delights to hear it. And then he quotes the song, Sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. You see what he's saying? Tell the Lord Jesus Christ that you love him. Tell him that you like him and prefer him before all other beloveds. Tell him that there is no one in all the creation to compare with him. Tell him that to you he's the fairest of 10,000. That there isn't a beloved in this world, potential or otherwise, that begins to begin to compare with him. He loves to hear it. You, you men, I'm sure, like me, your wife delights to hear you tell her that you love her. I hope you tell your wife that you love her. She'll never tire of it, especially when she sees you mean it. It's not just words, but she loves to hear it. And it's, it's true back. You just love to hear that you're loved. The Lord Jesus loves to hear his people tell him that we love him that we prefer him above and before all other potential beloveds in this world. And he replies, Song of Songs, sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. So there's his personal grace. We have communion with Christ and his personal grace. Reflect on him. He's the fairest of 10,000. He is the all glorious one. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He unites in himself our frail flesh. He stands at the right hand of the Father as the God-man resplendent in his one graces, and all heaven adores him. Tell him, tell him regularly, Lord Jesus, I'm here, bowed in your presence to tell you this. I love you. You first loved me. I love you because of the beauty of who you are. But then secondly, there is Christ's purchased grace. And Owen explains <clears throat> what he means by purchased grace. By purchased grace, 
I understand all that righteousness and grace which Christ has procured or wrought out for us, or doth by any means make us partakers of, or bestows on us for our benefit by anything that he has done, suffered, or by anything he continueth to do as mediator. Now that's another of Owen's Latinate sentences. And what Owen simply means is that by purchase grace, he means all that Christ has won and secured by his living, dying, and rising for his believing people. So how are we to enjoy communion with our Savior and purchase grace? Number one, says Owen, we do so by approving and embracing the divine way of salvation. In the gospel, we see our utter depravity before God, our spiritual poverty, and our just condemnation. But we also see that by God's grace, Jesus Christ is our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And so we have communion with Christ by approving, by embracing the divine way of salvation. Not just acknowledging it notionally, not just approving it as true, but embracing it. If you were only to tell your wife that you loved her, but you never embraced her, she would wonder what on earth was wrong with you. And we have communion with Christ by embracing him as mediator, as our blood-stained mediator. Isn't it an amazing thing that the only, I'll put it this way and then I'll qualify it, the only blemished body in heaven will be the nail-printed, nail-pierced body of the Lamb. Rich wounds, yet visible above in glory beautified. We are to embrace him as mediator, our blood-stained mediator, not just approving the truth, but loving the truth. You know, the danger in Reformed churches is that we become um, hyper-committed to truth. You think, well, how can you be hyper-committed to truth? Well, you can't be, of course. But you can, in a sense, because you dissociate truth from the person of Christ. You talk about his benefits. You talk about justification, sanctification, adoption. But how can you talk about those things apart from Jesus Christ? He is our wisdom from God, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In him we have adoption. There are no blessings outside of Jesus Christ. They are all in Jesus Christ. And so in the gospel, we find peace for our souls and we find glory to Christ. So we have communion with Christ by embracing him as our blood-stained mediator. But then secondly, says Owen, the Christian enjoys communion with Christ in holiness. Now on Christ's part, that involves him interceding with his Father by virtue of his oblation that he would bestow his Holy Spirit on them. Now you mustn't think when the Bible, Romans 8, 34, Hebrews 7, 25, talks about the intercession of Christ, you mustn't think that he's on bended knee pleading with the Father to bless his church. His glorified presence is his intercession. He doesn't need to beg anything from the Father when the Father beholds the Son and sees that the Son has won all things by his obedient Son to death, he gladly and freely gives the Son all things. And so the Son intercedes with the Father by virtue of his oblation, that he would bestow his Holy Spirit on them, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes as the Spirit of holiness, 
says Owen, who is the efficient cause of all holiness and sanctification, quickening, enlightening, purifying the souls of his saints. The Lord Jesus gives the spirit of holiness. And because of our union with Christ, we receive Christ's own holiness. The reformers were very bold in saying this, that we stand before God as righteous as his own son. Now, how could they say that? Because we are in his son, united to his son. We have the same righteousness as his son. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You know, if it wasn't in the Bible, you wouldn't believe it. It's more fantastic than anything Tolkien imagined, or C.S. Lewis, or whatever, or even J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. It's out of this world. We stand before God with the self-same righteousness as the Son of God. On our part, we receive by faith the gracious blessings of Christ. But then Owen says this, and this is where he comes to a kind of climactic moment in his exposition. We have communion with Christ by embracing him as mediator. We have communion with Christ in his holiness. But thirdly, we have communion with Christ in the grace of privilege before God. And the highest of the privileges is adoption. Owen says, the privileges we enjoy by Christ are great and innumerable. To insist on them in particular were the work of a man's whole life, not a design to be wrapped up in a few sheets. I shall take a view of them only in the head, the spring and fountain whence they all arrive and flow. This is our adoption. We have communion with Christ as heirs together with him of the glory of God as his brothers and sisters. He is our elder brother. We are adopted in him into the family of God. And so what is, Jim Packer puts it quite dramatically, if not perfectly accurately, but wonderfully, the Christian name for God is Father. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and in the space of a few verses, ten times he says to them, your father, your father, your father. Now, God is called father in the Old Covenant Scriptures, isn't he? Probably only on five or six occasions. And in the space of a few verses, Jesus is saying to his disciples, father, father, father. They come and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus says, when you pray, say, Our Father. Now let me say, Abba does not mean Daddy in Aramaic. It doesn't mean Daddy. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Your primary relationship as a believer in Christ to God is as his child. He is our Father in heaven. He's to be revered and feared. How I fear thee, living God with deepest, tenderest fears. But he is our Father, from whence all our sweetnesses flow, says Owen. He is our Father in heaven. And we have communion with Christ in the grace of adoption. He is, by nature, the Son of the Father. We are, by grace, the sons and daughters of the Father. Maybe like me, there are times you find prayer a struggle. And the thing that helps me more than anything else 
is to say to myself, sometimes, many times, Father, Father. Sometimes I'll pray slowly through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, reminding me that my communion with God is collegial and covenantal and corporate and not just individual. But that one word, Father, you see it in the parable of the two sons in Luke 15. And Jesus is condemning the Pharisees. They're saying to him, beginning of Luke 15, this man welcomes sinners. Well, Jesus didn't welcome sinners. He ran after sinners. And at the conclusion, and it is a conclusion and climax, the elder son, he gets really in the hump with his father, doesn't he? And what does he say? Do you remember what he says? He says, all these years I have slaved for you. He was a son in the father's house, but he thought of the father as a taskmaster and not a father. That, that's the key to the whole parable. All these years I've slaved for you. That was the mindset of the Pharisees. God was to be um, appeased by this work and that work and the next work. He was a taskmaster, always standing over us, ready to beat us if we didn't measure up. All these years I've slaved for you. And the father says, son, everything I have is yours. I've never been a slave master. I'm your father. And in the conclusion of his treatment with, of communion with the son, Owen outlines what we might call the fullness of fellowship with the son made possible through adoption. And he says a number of things. Let me see, you know, four, um, six, six things. In the son by adoption, number one, we have fellowship in name. We are as Jesus is, sons of God. Number two, we have fellowship in title and right. We are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. I, mean, I don't know what that means. I can read Romans eight seventeen. I can probably parse the sentence. I probably know etymology of all of the words. But what on earth does it mean to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ of the glory of God? What does that mean? It reminds me that there is a godly agnosticism at the heart of the Christian faith and the Christian religion. We're taken out of our depth. You know Paul's words at the end of Romans 11, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. His paths are beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Paul's been expounding the gospel gloriously and wonderfully. And then he says, but I'm out of my depth. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know so much. And maybe it's the older I get. The readier I am, the more ready I am to say to people, I, d I don't know. But I'll tell you what I do know. The gospel takes us out of ourselves into another world where we know in part. We should never give the impression we are know-it-alls, because we don't. You can't put God in a box. We are co heirs with Christ. Thirdly, we have fellowship or communion in likeness and conformity. He's thinking of Romans 8 29. We are predestined to be like the firstborn of the family. Why did God save you? You say, well, that's a silly question. He saved me to save me. No. He didn't save you simply to bring you from hell to heaven. Listen to Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
God's purpose in saving sinners was not simply to save the sinners, but to make his son the firstborn among many brothers. It's all about Jesus. I heard at a conference last year something that made me really smile. Um, a friend of mine was preaching, and he uh, was talking about uh, a young, uh, fine evangelical minister in Australia, an uh, Anglican, uh, who was talking to an older Anglican minister. And the young minister was really upset. He said, you know, my congregation don't appreciate me. I, 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 I labor, I, I preach, I, I visit, I expend myself. They just don't appreciate me. And he's looking for counsel from the older minister. And the older minister just looks at him and says this, it's not about you, stupid. <laughs> and I thought to myself, now that's the kind of older minister we need in our denominations. He was saying to the young man, stop thinking about yourself. The gospel's not about you, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about his God. God created you for the glory of his son. Colossians 1, all things were created by him. What's the next phrase? And through him and for him. You were made for Jesus Christ. And then fourthly, we have fellowship in honor. One of the great texts in the New Testament surely is Hebrews 2, is it 11? He is not ashamed to call us brethren. These are hard words to read without being moved, aren't they? He is not ashamed. I'm sometimes ashamed to call myself Ian Hamilton. The Lord of glory isn't ashamed to call me his brother, you his sister, you his sister, you his brother. He's not ashamed. It's a fellowship, a communion of honor. And then fifthly, it's a communion in sufferings. He learned obedience by what he suffered. And Paul says in Philippians 3 that I might know the fellowship, the communion of his sufferings. You see, suffering belongs to the very native heart of the Christian faith. In fact, Romans 8, 17, we are heirs together with Christ, joint heirs, provided that we suffer with him. And Paul tells the Philippians, look, don't, don't be upset that I'm in prison. As if something um, strange has happened that God hadn't ordained. He says, in fact, Caesar's household are getting to hear about the gospel. Now, it's easy to talk about suffering when you're not suffering. I've never known suffering. It's been minimal in the extreme compared to some people I know. I know folk who have been martyred for their faith and who have lost husbands and wives and children. Not known them well, but I know them. But we have a fellowship in sufferings. If, if we are not suffering for Christ, what does that mean? Some of you will know the writings of Amy Carmichael. Do you know Amy Carmichael? Joan loves Amy Carmichael. I don't know a lot about Amy. I, I, roughly her life and I've read some things. But she has a poem called Hast Thou No Scar. Do you know that poem at all? Hast thou no scar, no scar on hand or wound on side. But I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? No scar on hand or, or wound or on, on side. But as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow thee. But thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound? No scar. Remember Paul's words, let no man trouble me, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. We have fellowship in sufferings. And then sixthly, we have fellowship in his kingdom because we shall reign with him. 
we will reign with him. And so we have communion with Christ in his personal grace. We have communion with Christ in his purchase grace. Now I'm going to try and do something that probably um, preachers should never do. When you're a young preacher, you're told, don't weary your congregation with long, long quotes. When I was a young minister in Scotland, you know, I, I'd be reading during the week and I'd say to the folk on a Sunday, oh, I came across this wonderful passage in Owen or Calvin or whatever. Let me read it to you. And I'd read it and these glazed looks would look at me. And then I would do the unthinkable. I'd say, well, clearly you're not getting it. Let me read it again. <laughs> and they're all thinking, please, Ian, you've lived with it all week. You're inside. We're just hearing it. But let, let, let me try something as I close. In the course of his rich exposition, Owen has a passage of lyrical beauty, even for Owen, where he seeks to explain the surpassing excellence of Jesus Christ, with whom the believer has communion supremely in grace. It's a magnificent passage. Um, I think it's uh, volume 2, pages 77 to 78. I've not noted, I don't think I've noted the... Um, where exactly to find it. Uh, but from memory, I think it's pages 77 to 78 in volume 2. And he's explaining the excellencies of Jesus Christ. And he says this, Jesus Christ is lovely in his person. In the glorious all-sufficiency of his deity, gracious purity, and holiness of his humanity, authority, majesty, love, and power. He's lovely in his birth and incarnation. When he was rich for our sakes, becoming poor, taking part of flesh and blood, because we partook of the same, being made of a woman, that for us he might be made under the law, even for our sakes. Lovely in the whole course of his life. And the more than angelical holiness and obedience, which in the depth of poverty and persecution he exercised therein, doing good, receiving evil, blessing and being cursed, reviled, reproached all his days. Lovely in his death. Yea, therein most lovely to sinners. Never more glorious and desirable than when he came broken, dead from the cross. Then he had carried all our sins into a land of forgetfulness. Then he had made peace and reconciliation for us. Then had he procured life and immortality for us. Lovely in the glory and majesty wherewith he is crowned. Now he is set down at the right hand of majesty on high, where though he be terrible to his enemies, yet he is full of mercy, love, and compassion towards beloved ones. Lovely in all his ordinances. And the whole of that spiritually glorious worship which he hath appointed to his people, whereby they draw nigh and have communion with him and his Father, Lovely and glorious in the vengeance he taketh and will finally execute upon the stubborn enemies of himself and his people. Lovely in the pardon he hath purchased and doth dispense. In the reconciliation he hath established, in the grace he communicates, in the consolations he doth administer, in the peace and joy he gives his saints, in the assured preservation of them unto glory. And Owen concludes, what shall I say? There is no end of his excellencies and desirableness. He is altogether lovely. And his last words are these, this is our beloved, and this is our friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This indeed is our beloved. So let us tell him so, and let us embrace all that he has done for us, 
And let us never fail to tell him every day of our lives that we prefer him to all other beloveds that this world has to offer, even, even our nearest and our dearest. Amen.